Hello everyone, we're sneaking in a bit of eek math into your day to demonstrate how engineers use algebra and calculus to advance new ways for robots to work together, a key objective of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. I sat down with ocean engineer Val Schmidt to learn how he approaches a real-world problem. How do we optimize a search algorithm for a vessel like Drix to use its sensors to find an underwater robot friend should it get a bit lost? Join me in Nautilus's lounge as we get a bit geeky. Alright, so the scenario is this. Mesobot is lost, you don't know where he is, and you gotta go out and find him. And so, what's the most optimal way to go search for something that you're missing? And if you roughly know where he is, one of the most efficient ways to search is what's called an expanding box pattern, where you spiral out a fixed distance away from your previous path, covering more and more area centered on the place where you think he is. So then the question is, how far away should these be? And what speed should you travel along this path? And why is that not an easy thing to answer? All right, so hang in here, because we're about to go deep with equations and numbers. Now, we don't expect you to learn calculus from this, but I hope you'll stick with us to learn a few principles. One, underwater detection range can be described as a function of speed, and two, we can find the best balance of range and speed to optimize our search pattern using calculus. Got it? Okay, so here's Val again. Okay, so Mesobot is misplaced. We gotta go find the little guy. We don't know where he is. We know that the most efficient way to go find him is this expanding box pattern. What we don't know is how far each of the circles of our expanding box pattern should be from the next one. And it's not an easy thing to answer because it turns out our ability to listen to the acoustic signals that Mesobot is sending us is dependent on how fast we're going. It's like sticking your head out the car window of a car doing 50 miles an hour. You can't hear a thing but the wind going by. And it's the same thing underwater. If you go slow, you can hear really far distances. If you go fast, you can't hear a thing. So we need a mathematical expression that roughly describes that variation of the distance that we can hear, maybe R in an equation, versus the speed that we're going, which I've used the variable V here. So we've got the distance R, 500 meters plus four times 1500 divided by V squared. Where in the heck did that come from? Well, that came from some experiments that we did earlier on and a bit of shooting from the hip, frankly, from myself. But we came up with this expression so that when you're going four meters per second, it comes out to about 2000 meters. And when you're going six meters per second, which is the maximum speed that Drix can go, it, it's a little bit more than 500 meters per second. So now we've got an expression for how far you can hear based on the speed that you're going. Now we need an expression for how much area we can cover in our search per unit time. And that expression is the area per unit time or per second, it's equal to 2R because we can listen to the right side and we can listen to the left side. So that's 2R times the speed at which we're going V. And so for every second, we uh, listen to some area that's equal to that expression. Okay, so we can take that expression and we can stick our expression for R in that equation. So then we get the area per unit second is equal to two times the quantity of 500 plus, and then we're multiplying four times 1500, which is uh, 6,000, plus 6,000 over V squared, and then we've got all of that multiplied by V at the end. Hey there, still with us? Well, like this is a different number than I got before. So. The internet will tell you if you're wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I know that's, that's what worries me. I love this moment because it shows an important element of math. Always check your work. It's definitely a different answer than I got last time. Okay, so now let me think about what I've done and if I made some mistake. Oh, I did make a mistake. That too has got to be multiplied by that 6,000, not just the, that one. So this is 12,000. As Val corrected it, you'll see those corrections in our grand calculus finale. That's why you always check your work, Jonathan. <laughs> always. Because this could save somebody's life. So 
Calculus gives us this great tool for figuring out how to optimize one expression that's a function of another. So in this case, how to optimize the area covered per unit time as a function of the speed that we're going. And that's called a derivative. And a derivative is a funny word, but all it means is how fast a function changes with time or, or with space or whatever. So if it's going up really fast, it, it may be a big positive number. If it's going down really fast, it's a really big negative number. But if it's not, if it's at the top of the hill, the slope is zero up there. But that's super helpful because we can take a derivative of our expression and then set that to zero. And that'll tell us the optimal speed to go to cover the most amount of distance per unit traveled. So I take my expression for area covered per unit second. And the first thing I'm going to do is simplify this expression a little bit. I'm going to multiply through by the two and then multiply by the V. And I'm going to get area covered per unit time is 1000 V plus 12,000 divided by V. And then I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to the speed or, or V. And that's going to be 1000 plus minus one times 12,000 divided by the V squared. Okay, so then I take that expression, I set it equal to zero, I solve for V squared and uh, do some mental uh, manipulation of all the numbers there, and I get V is equal to square root of 12, and I can whip out my calculator and figure out that that's 3.46 meters per second or about seven knots or so. Okay, so now I have the speed at which to go that optimize the amount of area coverage. I need to figure out what the range is so that I know how to do my do that math and I come up with a number that's about a thousand. So that tells me that each of these spirals going around need to be about 2000 meters apart. And now I know the optimal speed to go and that will ensure that I cover the most amount of area per unit time so I can go find my little buddy who's who's uh, who's missing. Okay, so this is cool. It's a real world application where we're breaking out our calculus from from high school, probably, or maybe undergraduate. And we're solving a real world problem where we're figuring out what the optimal way is to go do something that is really important. And this could be a robot that's lost, but it could be a person overboard or a down plane or whatever. Uh, these tools you keep in your toolbox, you pull them out when you need them to solve problems like this, sometimes under duress while you're at sea or sometimes in the lab when you're before you go. But, um, but having those tools in your toolkit are really important. Okay, we've done our math. We've got our range, it's 2000 meters. Roland has planned up uh, expanding search, bot, search pattern with that, that, uh, that line spacing set. We can execute that search pattern and, uh, and Drix will dutifully go and find Mezobot. How do you like them apples? It's pretty spicy. Yeah. All right, you want to hear my favorite, one of my favorite math stories? 